Good morning. Beautiful pictures there that uh, Kaylee put together. Thank you, Kaylee. John 11, 25 to 27. Jesus speaking to Martha, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he dies, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God. Della believed and accepted as Martha did. I know her prayer would be that you, as you sit here today, would consider and accept believing in Jesus Christ and trusting him to direct you in your life as well. Welcome to you all. We, uh, as the family, love you, appreciate you coming out on a, on a Saturday morning to join us and celebrate the life of Della Deming, better known as Nanny to most of us. I will also say that on behalf of her friends, her family here at Lafayette Federated Church, which I am a member of, we offer heartfelt condolences to my family, the Deming family, this day. Della, better known, as I said, as, to, uh, as Nanny, mother to Richard and Raymond, grandmother to myself, Scott, my cousin Chad, good to see you, bud, and Caitlin, great-grandmother to Joshua, Jonathan, Christopher, Kaylee, Brandon, and Megan, Amber, and Zachary and a great-great-grandmother to Micah. Nanny, a lady with great determination for life and fiercely independent. With that, though, was a lady with immense love for all of you. And I'm sure that's why you're here, because you loved her. What made her smile was seeing you, talking with you, being with you even probably drove her on Sunday mornings so often to push herself to get here for Sunday service, to see you all, to get to used to Bible study meetings, and so many, if not most, family events. Remember her as you see the slides and other remembrances today, and know that she loved you each and every one of you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time to reflect upon a life lived for you. We thank you for Nanny. We thank you for her dedication to Christ, dedication to her family, her friends, her church. We thank you for this time. We ask that as we reflect that you will be honored by our words, and what we do today, in Jesus' name, amen. I'd like you to stand as we sing hymn number 364. Linda will lead us, and then remain standing as Kaylee will lead us in the Lord's Prayer together.
Please join me in reciting the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I come to the garden alone While the dew is still on the roses And the voice I hear falling on my ear The Son of God discloses and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me i am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever He speaks, and the sound of his voice is so sweet. The birds hush their singing, and the melody that he gives to me within my heart is ringing. And he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever I'd stay in the garden with him Though the night around me be falling But he bids me go Through the voice of woe His voice to me is calling and and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. Amen. Good morning. Uh, I'll be reading from Proverbs and from Psalms, uh, but before I did, I just wanted to share a quick story about Nan, one that kind of gives an example of how I remembered her for the a couple years that I got to know her, thankfully. Um, two years ago, uh, Jamie and I were pregnant with Micah, and it was time to tell the family, tell Grandma and Grandpa and Nan, and uh, so we were over at Mom and Dad's house, and we had brought the sonogram picture with us, and we handed it to Nan. She just kind of looked at it, good poker face, just kind of looking. 
And Grandpa leans over in his soft-spoken, gentle way <laughs> and says, do you know what that is? And she's like, yeah, they're pregnant. So um, it was just the way she was. She was, <laughs> she was happy to see everybody. She was happy for us. And uh, anyway, that's how I remember Nan. Um, from Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. And Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you were with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen.
Greener pastures. Boy, this little girl, she knew him in Landaff, New Hampshire, where she came from, that's for sure. So, And I might just say, I wasn't, didn't have this written, but uh, what a joy the uh, Karen Ann Quinlan home was where she had her last days. She looked out the back to the west in her room, got ten rooms in this beautiful facility they made. And... Uh, she gets room number six on the back side, looks at the Kittatinny Ridge, about 50, 60 feet out the door. The horses come up to the fence in the morning and at night. What a joy for a lady who came from the hills of New Hampshire. She watched the dew rise, as she told me, off the valley onto the hilltops in the morning. A nurse told us a story, right? That she sat with her every night and uh, watch the sun set down over those trees as the horses came up to the fence. So she lived those green pastures, and uh, I imagine they're a whole lot greener now, for sure. So this is a time for all of you, any one of you that you'd like to reflect on how Nan has affected your life. I would ask that uh, you just give a moment for the family to have a few words, those who would like, and then I'll motion to the rest of you. If you'd like to come up, fine. Otherwise, my son Joshua and Christopher will have a mic on either side and can come to you. It'll be a little easier and quicker, probably. So, Dad? Good morning to you, and uh, I want to thank you so much for being here this morning, for taking time out of your day. It's a Saturday. We have just endured the monsoons, and uh, so I'm sure a lot of you may have had work to do, places to be, enjoying a boat or a motorcycle, and uh, you took your time away from that uh, to be here, and so I thank you. As many of you know, uh, I was a police officer, and uh, I don't consider myself to be uh, afraid of much. Uh, a couple of things come to mind. Maybe my wife when she's mad, <laughs> or root canal, and I guess the next one would be coming up to this podium. <laughs> it's, uh, it's an experience, but uh, I am thankful to be able to celebrate, and I want this to be a celebration, we know we have confidence. We are assured that mom is in a better place. She is in heaven with the Lord, and that's where she wanted to be. And so we are, uh, want it to be a celebration. Thank you, Lord, that she is out of pain. Uh, her last days were very painful. Uh, her, she had chronic lymphatic leukemia. And that doesn't mean a whole lot to you, to me, and maybe not a lot to you either, but I can tell you it's deadly. It, uh, it, she was diagnosed as being terminal. And that had creeped into the bones in her legs. And uh, her last few days, she was on uh, a regimen of morphine and Ativ was it? Ativan uh, to take away the anxiety. And uh, so uh, it was, uh, was a hard time for for her and hard time for us to watch. So uh, I'd like to extend some uh, thank yous. We thank you for those who traveled so far. Um, I did not expect 
some of the people that are here, family, to have traveled this far, and so uh, I would just want to mention those people. Uh, my cousin Stan, who will sing in a little while here, he and his wife traveled from Seattle, Washington. Um, my cousin uh, Ellie and her husband came down from Springfield. Uh, my cousin Bill and Ruth came in from Waterbury, Connecticut. Um, who am I missing? Uh, my... Chad came in from the Youngstown, Ohio area. Uh, my good friend uh, is here, a retired pastor, uh, came up from Bassett, uh, Virginia. Do I have that right, brother? Yeah. And so uh, those people traveled a long ways along with local people, and people coming up from uh, South Jersey and from the Bergen County area, so I appreciate that. Uh, I've been, um, through the years, cautioned. Uh, when you give thank yous, be very careful because you'll probably forget somebody. Uh, but I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to take a chance, and uh, I'll make you a deal. If I forget you, I'll buy you lunch. How's that? <laughs> so uh, we are most uh, grateful to the deacon program of this church, and particularly Grace Carroll, who uh, would come when I'm sure not every time was easy, uh, people have lives to live, and I've got to go and sit with this elderly lady now and try and uh, minister and humor her through the afternoon while Dick and Florence get a little time away. And so uh, we were uh, so grateful that she would come and be so faithful, and uh, we are so thankful for the USTA. Uh, that is a kind of an acronym that the ladies here came up with. They wanted to have a group of ladies get together and... Uh, talk about how it used to be, <laughs> and uh, in the same time, they would uh, minister to one another, so it was kind of a neat uh, thing that they did, and my mother loved it and cherished the time. Uh, once a month, they would get together. Uh, thank you to a lady named Janet uh, Neidhart, who uh, came to visit her all the time and uh, was so uh, generous of her time. She came to the uh, hospice home um, Several times, I can't tell you how many times, we would sit with her through the afternoon and read scripture to her, and so we're so thankful for her. Um, we also uh, think of uh, Pastor Aaron. Uh, I had called him. We knew the days were numbered. Vacation Bible School was going with a couple of hundred kids here, and I had called Olga in the office and said, uh, if it's at all possible, I think that she would like to see him. I, it seems like I hardly turned around, uh, and he was there. <laughs> I thought, you must have a rocket ship out in the garage there somewhere. But anyway, he, he ministered to her. She was a little bit uh, concerned about her mortality. Am I dying? And, uh, and also her eternal security. Is there really a place up there somewhere? I believe there is. I know there is. But could you reassure me that there is? And uh, he was extremely gracious and sat with her. Florence and I actually left the room to leave him time to just not be interrupted by <laughs> yours truly, like, wait a minute, I, what did you, you know. So anyway, we said, let's take a walk and get a cup of coffee. And, he, and, uh, and then he uh, uh, served her communion, and that was an extremely special time for her. And uh, so he is not present today. He's on vacation, a well-deserved vacation in uh, where his family is in Missouri, uh, I'm not quite sure where that is, but <laughs> anyway, uh, he is with family, and so not here, uh, but I do want to publicly extend our appreciation uh, for all that he did, and uh, and then uh, uh, not to forget uh, her very good friend, Dottie. Dottie LaPrell, God bless her. She loved my mother with all of her heart. She spent many, many hours Days she would come in the afternoons and sit with her. Days at the hospice center, she would sit and hold her hand and uh, pray with her and, and just do so many uh, kind and wonderful things. And uh, one of the special days was when she came with the Eusta ladies and they had a little luncheon. And uh, they just, to hear them laugh and to enjoy one another's company. And uh, you, you would think that mom was at a five-star resort. <laughs> as opposed to being in a hospice home where, you know, she's uh, diagnosed uh, terminal. Um, mom was a special person. Uh, aren't all moms special? But my mother had a gentle smile, 
a gentle spirit, uh, loved to talk to people. Uh, after church, she couldn't get out of the corner where we normally sat. People come to see her and to um, just um, love to talk to her about anything and everything. And uh, I love to talk to the grandchildren. Some of our special times were once a year, she didn't have a lot of money, but she would drop uh, money for lunch for the whole family. And we would go to something like the Lafayette House, and we would take a real long table, and she'd sit in the middle and just kind of like Mother Hen looking over her brood, just kind of ooing at great to see the grandkids and everybody together. And so those were special times that I remember her. And, and as has been mentioned, uh, she just loved to uh, be with the family as much as she could. So uh, she loved the Lord with all of her heart. That's been mentioned, and it was true. Uh, I would add that at home, because she lived with us for the last 12 years, uh, near the end, she would uh, have her breakfast, and then she would go in uh, our den, and she would start to read her Bible, and she would be like, and I'd say, Mom, could I read it for you? No, I'm okay. And she couldn't see anymore. We had glasses, and it wasn't effective. She just was getting so tired and so old, she could not. She would take what normally would take us a matter of a few minutes to read a chapter. It would take her an hour, uh, but she wanted to do it her way. As Todd mentioned, she had an independent spirit, and she was going to do it, and she was going to enjoy uh, her time in the Scripture. She just loved to read the Bible, so um, she, uh, she will be missed. But we take resolution, confidence in the fact that we know where she is. So uh, with that said, I thought I'm going to take the liberty to uh, do a little. People say, well, where did Deller, like somebody just asked me this morning, uh, where did she grow up? Or where did she come from? So I'm going to do a little history lesson that may be out of the ordinary for uh, a service of this type, but I think that would be interesting for you to uh, to know. So Della was born in uh, 1918, uh, July 30th to be exact, in a little town called Mackindoos. I don't know how to spell it, but it's on the uh, uh, border of New Hampshire and Vermont, in Vermont, on the uh, Connecticut River. And uh, we think that she lived there till about age two or three. And uh, it was a small town. I don't even think Mackindoos is on the map anymore. Uh, one of these paper towns like uh, gets absorbed into a bigger town, like Augusta is part of Frankfurt or that type of scenario. And uh, she moved to even a smaller town, uh, one in which Eloise, my cousin, grew up in, called Landaff, L-A-N-D-A-F-F, -F, in New Hampshire. And when I'm saying small... Uh, we're talking about minuscule. Uh, <laughs> uh, even small towns have a gas station, and they have uh, a convenient mart, and they have uh, certain things that kind of make a town. Uh, Landaff has a Grange Hall and a Methodist church. You've seen it. That's it. It's all over uh, a farming community. Uh, the closest town is Lisbon is where you went to buy that gas and food products and so forth. We believe she moved there somewhere in the area of, uh, oh, maybe 1921. Um, my uh, uh, grandmother, Lucy, uh, they had four girls, so that's my mother and three sisters. And uh, they uh, tried to uh, exist, I think, from what I read, uh, with Lucy trying to provide for them. Well, there came a time when... Uh, we think uh, somewhere around 1922, uh, I call him Frank the Rat. Uh, her father decided he had other places to be. So he left Lucy with four girls in the, in the early 20s to uh, make do the best she could. Well, Lucy uh, went to uh, people by the name of Young, Y-O-U-N-G, uh, Carl and Norma who lived nearby, and my cousin Eloise knows more of the exact uh, history on it, but uh, it was a second cousin, I'm told, to Carl's mother, something like that. Anyway, they were distant relatives. And uh, she said, I have four girls, and I can't afford to raise them. Would you raise Della? And I have no idea what the conversation was, but Della ended up there. And... Uh, they, uh, they raised her until she went to high school and graduated in 1936. And uh, Norma was 
uh, the, in my opinion, uh, the epitome of a homemaker. Uh, she taught my mother so many things that she had passed on to Florence, uh, such as uh, baking. My mother, you know, everybody has got this story about family that can do things, uh, cook or whatever, but my mother would, until 10 years ago, make you the finest pie. Uh, she just had a knack for crust and make it, you know, flaky and great. And, and she, so she taught Florence to cook. She taught Florence to uh, to sew. She taught her how to knit. I can remember when we were first married, she'd have these two needles and she's trying to, and she'd miss a stitch, drop a stitch, whatever you call it, and have to, she'd be sitting there in front of the TV pulling it all out to fix it and do it. And she taught her to embroider and she taught her to can. We had a small farm down the road here years ago and we had a big garden. And so how do you can stuff? Uh, you know, some people don't think much about it today. Can is the, what you put in the, in the, uh, opener and you mm, it goes around and that's can but no uh, in this case you put it in a jar and you cook it and you do whatever and so she taught her how to do lots of things and so Norma uh, was a a, a real teacher uh, mentor and she passed that on thank God to my wife Florence and uh, so um, 1936 she's out she we don't quite know what she did for a couple of years. 1938, she marries my father. They knew each other in high school. I don't know that they were child sweethearts, but uh, they're married. Uh, 1940, the first baby comes along. Uh, Florence just told me this the other day. I did not know that or remember it, uh, but she said she knew the baby was dead, uh, that she had not felt any movement, and so she was correct. There was a uh, cord around its neck. So the baby was born uh, dead. They never named him, it was a male. Uh, he's buried next to my father in Landaf. Uh, no name was ever given to the baby. And uh, 1942, they tried it again. I think this one they wanted to throw back, but <laughs> they uh, thankfully kept it. 1948, uh, along comes Ray, my brother, and uh, he was a keeper. They, uh, I remember he was a lot of fun as a, as a baby and as a toddler. We used to have the, the best times, and, uh, and this, there was a, a movie about, uh, you know, one of these home 8-millimeter things, uh, and he was so funny at the time there. And uh, we, again, like I said, was a small town, and work was hard to get. My father worked in a milk bottling plant most of uh, during World War II. That kept him out of the service. Uh, but uh, by 1951... It was tough to get work up in the, the hills of New Hampshire. I have no idea how she reestablished contact with my grandfather, Frank, but she did. And so uh, she, I don't, we hardly had a phone. We had one of these that you, you rang it up and it went into the small town of Lisbon and you said, Connie, could you give me an outside line? And uh, it, people can't relate to that now. It really wasn't just pick up the phone and dial it up. And there certainly were no cell phones. So I believe that she probably wrote, and uh, she said, we're out of work and out of luck and out of money, and uh, would you be able to help us out? And so he said, you know, I have a four-apartment uh, uh, house with a delicatessen underneath, and it just happens one of those apartments are empty. If you want to come right down, you can have it. And I know a good friend for uh, Bendix Corporation uh, in Teterboro, and I'm sure I can get him work, which all of that happened. Uh, my father at the time had this little coupe, uh, which is a small version of a regular car. This had two seats and a jump seat right in the back, and we all fit in there. I don't know how we did it. I think Ray sat on my whole uh, lap the whole way from New Hampshire to New Jersey, but anyway, that and a couple of suitcases, and we've moved. That tells you the position we were in. Uh, we lived there uh, for several years in about 1954. Uh, my father took a job as a superintendent of a large apartment house, and he also worked in a sweater factory. And uh, 1958, he gets a call from Angus Campbell, who was my uncle. And I just want to take a moment to tell you one of the finest. Uh, if this service brings a tear to my eye, mentioning Angus Campbell brings a tear to my eye. Uh -huh. Stan and Bill Campbell's father. Uh, a devout Christian, but a man of integrity and honesty and just 
what do we call it, a Class A guy, and that was Angus Campbell. He called and said, hey, Walter, you, uh, you, you doing okay? And he said, well, you know, I'm working in a sweater factory. I'm not too happy about it, and I'm working as a superintendent. He said, well, I'll tell you what. I don't know if you heard about this, but <laughs> this is the latest news. Uh, they launched a nuclear submarine. They call it the Nautilus. And uh, right after that, they launched a second one called the Seawolf, and they're building submarines, and he said that's where he worked, at Electric Boat Division of General Dynamics in Groton, Connecticut. He said, I think if you come up here, uh, I can get you in the union, get you in at work. And, uh, boy, uh, we moved in 58. Uh, not the greatest time for me, uh, about to be a junior in high school, uh, but it all worked out. And so uh, uh, we lived in Groton until uh, Florence and I were married, and Florence and I went to Jersey. Um, and uh, 1971, my father dies. He was 54, and uh, they lived in kind of a suburban, not rural, but mostly suburban type of uh, community in uh, Connecticut. And uh, I say that it only has uh, relevance because uh, he had had angina. Uh, we didn't know a lot about that, or at least none of the doctors would admit it. They thought they knew. But uh, the only people really, from what I've read and have been told, have no way to corroborate it, uh, Boston General in Boston had started doing bypass surgery. I don't think they had any uh, great amount of uh, expertise at that point, but they had started. Uh, to the day she died, my mother wished she would have put my father in an ambulance and taken him to Boston General uh, with the idea that possibly uh, they could have done bypass surgery. Uh, again, not knowing a whole lot about those type of things, the death certificate says he died of coronary thrombosis. He had a blockage that was so much that the artery blew out the side of his heart. He went out uh, like a light, the doctor said. If I was in the room, I could not have done a thing to help the man. Uh, and the reason I mentioned the uh, suburban and rural area, uh, no police force. Uh, my mother sat holding him in her lap, his head in her lap for a couple of hours until a state trooper came off one of the big highways in Connecticut uh, to assist and to call the right people to take care of that. A strong woman, that gives you an idea, to sit there by herself. Uh, there were no neighbors apparently home at the time. Um, 1986, she's uh, diagnosed with bladder cancer. Uh, were there options? Oh, probably. You know, everybody can always second guess, well, if I had been there, we would have, well, we did what we thought was best, and at that time it was the thing is totally full of cancer. We're not going to try anything like chemo or any of these other things. They took it out. Well, that left her with a bag on her side called a urostomy, which I have uh, so many memories of trauma and drama over that, <laughs> over that urostomy leak. We, had to, we went to Radio City, had hardly got into the place, and Florence said she has a leak, and I think they spent half of the time down in the ladies' room trying to stuff her, you know, side full of napkins or whatever. So just lots of trauma with that crazy thing. And they did it wrong. When they originally put it in, they goofed it up. So the doctor said, well, she's still got another side. We'll just sw switch it over. And, uh, and that left her with a hernia. <laughs> it just, just was awful, that whole episode. And uh, so, uh, not to uh, try and top off Nan, but in 1987, Florence is diagnosed with breast cancer. And so we went through uh, that trauma, and Nan was, uh, Nan was such a great help in getting us through that period. Uh, 1987, also Todd and Rebecca were married, uh, and it was a joy for my mother to see that. Uh, 1997, uh, Scotty is uh, married. And uh, that was the year that I retired as a policeman. I had gone on in 1972 and so did 25 years and uh, so retired. Uh, Scotty bought our house in Hawthorne. Uh, we moved to New Hampshire because, uh, as a lot of you know, I like to play with airplanes. And so we moved to an air park. And mother would come and spend uh, a month at a time with us and just uh, got to know all our friends and people in our church. And, and so uh, she loved to go up there and spend time with us. Um, uh, one little guy that I left out was Joshua, born in 1990, and she just really absolutely loved that little guy. I can remember pictures of her with him. And uh, 19, uh, no, uh, correction, 2000 and maybe one, 
uh, Scotty decided he wanted to move, uh, sell the house. It was a big house, and it was a two-family, and he was tied to tenants and all the other things that go with it. So he bought a house in Vernon, and uh, his wife, Spring, and my mother uh, got in cahoots, and they decided, why didn't mother uh, move in with them? And she, they did. Uh, they, she lived there, I believe it was around 2001. Scotty could uh, correct me. but uh, And she lived with them until 2006. 2005, we came back from New Hampshire. Florence's folks were uh, elderly and sickly and really needed help. And so Florence came to me one day and said, could we go home? And I thought, well, I thought we were, but she meant New Jersey. Could we go back? And I really know that I want to be there. Uh, and so, um, sure, we put the house on the market, sold it fairly quickly. And uh, I never, ever wanted to buy a house again. I had had enough of houses. And uh, so we rented purposely, deliberately. And uh, my mother came and said, you know, living with Scott is fine but I have so many things that are not being taken care of. I can't remember if I took this pill, and so I think I'm doubling up on some pills, and I can't get to my doctor's appointments because the family is busy, and uh, could I come to live with you? And we said, sure. And so in uh, about 2006, uh, she came to live with us, and she lived with us until she died here, which would be roughly 12 years. and. Uh, that's the story of Della Deming. Uh, she um, loved everything, I think, that she ever did. She would make the most of nothing. Uh, I can remember when uh, we were in Groton, Connecticut. Uh, we belonged to the local church, and uh, she would say, well, you come to our house for lunch. These fellows from the submarine base would come there and go to church, and she thought, well, they can't go to a restaurant or a McDonald's or something, they got to come home. And my father would say, well, what are you going to make? She said, I'll make something out of nothing. It's not a, not a problem. I'll just I'll whip something up. And those guys really uh, grew to love her to the point that so many of them would really contact her later in life. Uh, I drove her all the way to Morgantown, West Virginia, one time to uh, see one of them because she wanted to see him. And uh, she had not seen him in over 20 years. And so it... Uh, it was great to have uh, those fellas. Uh, they actually became like, like uh, stepbrothers to me in a sense. Uh, so, and of course, my my family, uh, Stan and 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 Bill, became like brothers. Uh, Bill and I worked. I used, had a job after school that would uh, uh, stock shelves in the First National, and he was an assistant manager. And and Stan was always around. Stan uh, went to. Went to war in 61 or two there. I know he was there in 63. And uh, um, so uh, we worried and prayed about him. Uh, you have an honest-to-God hero in our midst with Stan. He uh, went on, a, on a, a mission that you had to volunteer for. I can't order you to go. And uh, came out with a bronze star. And uh, every Veterans Day or whatever, I always tell him, hey, this is your, your cousin Rich, I'm calling my hero, uh, that you uh, decided to go and support your country, uh, whether you like the war or not. Uh, I'm not here to preach, but why, whether you like the war or not, those are our flesh and blood that went over there. So we honor them when they come back regardless. When it, they're not responsible for whatever decisions are made by our uh, president, vice president, whoever was running the show in those days. They did what they were told to do. And uh, so uh, we have to be thankful. I, I meet guys in a restaurant and I say, I'm embarrassed to uh, see how you were treated uh, when you came back home. I, uh, I just feel that, you know, you didn't deserve to be spit on and ignored and left at the airport to get home somehow. And those people were. And so I tell the people, I appreciate your service and uh, welcome home. and. Uh, I'm sorry that as an American, I consider myself a patriot that you had to come home to that. So I always uh, uh, acknowledge Stan as being a, a true hero. So uh, we have a very good friend of ours by the name of John Coppinall. I We all refer to him as Jack. And uh, Jack um, uh, pastored the Rhinebeck First Baptist Church for, I don't know, 25 or 30 years comes up through this area occasionally. We did not get to see him this last time he came through because of my mother 
uh, but we usually try to catch up with him. And uh, he sent a very lovely letter uh, of condolence. And uh, he also sent uh, some verses and some other printed material. And uh, he sent a poem. I am not a poem kind of guy. Uh, I'm not saying if you are that there's anything wrong with it. I just never really got on board with poems, but uh, this one I thought was apropos, and I'll try to get through it. The title of it is The Weaver. My life is but a weaving. However, my Lord and me, I cannot choose the colors. He works steadily. Oft times he weaveth sorrow, and I in foolish pride forget he sees the upper side, and I see the underside. The dark threads are as needful in the weaver's skillful hand as the threads of gold and silver in the pattern that he has planned. Not till, Jesus, the, not till this loom is silent, not till the shuttles cease to fly, shall God unfold the canvas, and I'll know the reason why. Who wants to follow that? You can take the microphone off your list now. You're not afraid of that either. <laughs> Somebody else, you can come up here. Microphone, again, Christopher and Josh Abbott. And go ahead, Dottie.
just like him. He forgot about God as a wonderful wife, a wonderful mother, a godly woman. I'm going to tell you about the killer who was the matchmaker. Stan and I started dating. I was in my junior year in my nursing program. Stan had just gone into the service. We had dated a couple of times. But I knew right away. In fact, on our second date, I told someone I had just met the man I was going to marry. Years later, we did marry, but the war, the Vietnam War, came in between. Shortly before Stan was to go to Vietnam, Della decided that she wanted Stan to come for dinner. Stan invited me, and as far as I knew, we were going to Aunt Della's for dinner. We got there. Stan had already conversed with. And Flo. Flo's dad was a jeweler. Stan had a lot of ring. And Della made the arrangements for Stan to give me that ring just shortly before he left for Vietnam. So my memory of Della is one of um, why I'm not directly in her family. I always felt how that was. We love Rich, we love Flo. They're like brothers and sisters to us, and Della was an aunt to me as well as to my husband. And I'm very thankful to have known her. I'm sorry I wasn't able to get here in time to see her before she passed. But I will see her again someday. Amen. And I'll be thankful. Amen. Hi. I'm Janet Dennis, and I belong to the Euster group that Della belonged to. And Euster stands for we used to do this and we used to do that. We had a great time. It was run by Janet and I. Had. So Janet picked me up and a couple of others, and we went to the nursing home as the Euster group. And of course, we had cream toast and ice cream sandwiches. This is 10.30 in the morning, you know. <laughs> anyway, Janet loves to sing. Well, as most of you know, I cannot sing. I can't carry a tune, I can't carry a note. So we sing. Now there are six of us singing. Now you've got to understand, I'm one of the youngest in my 70s. They're all in their 80s and 90s and 100s or whatever they are. <laughs> their voices are well, just to let you know, we put Della to sleep. We did. And I looked over at Janet and I said, she's sleeping. She sounds asleep. <laughs> but that's my best memory of Della in, in the nursing home. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. story. Uh, a couple things about Aunt Della that actually goes way back. Um, Walt and uh, Aunt Della stood uh, up my folks. They eloped and 13 months later I came along. Uh, so we've known the, the family for a long time. Actually the Deming, uh, some of you are related to me and I don't even know who you are. But back one more is uh, when uh, Grandma Deming died, they sang in the garden. So I was happy to hear Hmm. Sing that. Um, so it's a rich heritage. The Demons have a rich heritage. But the Demings and the uh, Campbells really were close. Um, all our days, most of the days growing up, Rich, Stan, and I, and Ray. Ray was a little younger, so you know when you're in high school, you don't even know the kid. He's just a little uh, whatever. Um, <laughs> but he is my cousin. Um, the other thing we have in Tom, uh, common is uh, Ruth and I have rings from, uh, from Grandpa. Close to that. Um, long story with that too, but I'm um, very grateful. Uh, I paid thirty-five dollars for my ring. <laughs> it's lasted fifty-nine. It's a good years. price. Um, so I'm grateful. Um, but uh, what's been said about our daughter is very true. Um, their family hosted a lot of sailors and cadets. My folks lived in Groton, hosted a lot of cadets. In fact, in my high school days, a lot of my big Christian brothers were in the cabinet, so I got to go. 
football games, concerts, sailing. Um, so a lot in common, just hospitality, Christian hospitality. The young men who had no homes, many a Sunday, both homes were uh, serving sailors and cadets. Um, my last memory is though, is the last couple of years, um, we had 10, Rich and Flo with our daughter, and Ruth and I meet halfway at Fish, uh, Fishfield, is that a diner? And uh, one year, Stan and Joe were in the, the area, so all six of us met with Aunt Deller. Um, so almost twice a year, we've met the four of us with Aunt Deller. Um, one of the memories I have, we we're trying to remember names one uh, one time at the diner, and Aunt Deller knew all the names mm -hmm. of all the people. Um, I do have fond memories. Uh, July 4th, I called Richard uh, a couple days before then and asked how Aunt Deller was doing. Uh, by the way, my sister's been very faithful. She's actually watching, I think, on streaming. She would call Aunt Della every week. Mm -hmm. Every week. Every Sunday. Faithful to see how Aunt Della was doing. Um, so then on July uh, 4th, Richard had said, my cousin, Jean's coming from Cleveland to see Aunt Della. So I said to Ruth, where are going? So the six of us met uh, down in the, um, at the home and had a good time for a couple hours. Our dollar right at the end was still very, very sharp, uh, very in tune with all of us. Our conversations were just a delight to be with us. So many fond memories. I can tell you a lot of stories about Rich and Doug. We worked together for several years. I won't tell you those. Um, but we really have. He said we're like brothers. And uh, my dad was very um, helpful after our Uncle Walt passed. And really we are like brothers. We say cousins. So, but a lot of you, make sure you get to say that to me. You are a Demi. I don't even know who you are. I'd love to meet you. You do have a rich heritage. And God has been very good for our double to carry it on. And we're glad that, like Jonathan is carrying it on. We're very excited where Jonathan is going. But um, so we're just grateful to be here. And I, again, appreciate all you guys, uh, you folks who've taken the time out to come today. Uh, it means a lot to him. Amen. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> Couple others? Right? Thank you. 
Ferguson. Thank you, Ray. One or two more. Okay, well, we thank you very much for those memories and reflections about NAN. I'd like to introduce Stan Campbell. And as you've heard, it's uh, my dad's cousin, Mandela's nephew, to sing a song. You notice when you get old how hard it is to climb steps? You notice that? You just did. And then it's hard to come down, too. I found that. Uh, just a chance to say a few words before I try to sing. Sometimes it's harder, something like this, to sing. Uh, I remember that old coupe. It was called a terraplane. Right. right. And most kids today say, what? But I remember that. We rode in that, a terraplane. I remember Aunt Dylan one thing specifically, if you didn't want an honest opinion, then don't ask her because she's going to tell you. And she passed that on to Rich. <laughs> and, 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 I, and I say that because he, I can say that because he and I are a lot alike and we call each other quite a bit and we share a lot of the same views. And I remember I worked at Electric Boat and many times they used to say at a meeting because when I was involved in they had, me, had to call me to the meetings. And they say, well, here comes Campbell again. He's going to get out in the weeds. And I can remember, Ray, you know things like that, the paradigm shift. And the first time I heard that word, I said, a what? And I got in the meeting, and I said, you know, I don't understand all these things. And I'm like Rich. I would say, well, what are you talking about, right? And why? And how? I said, I understand these little words, not these big words. How are we going to do it when and who is going to do it? And generally, I got the answer, well, that's under development. And my question was always, then why did you ask me to come to the meeting? But anyway, I would give my opinion. And I just share that lovingly, that if you didn't want an honest opinion, then don't ask, because she's going to tell you exactly what she thinks, and she's not going to beat around the bush. We both get in trouble for that, too, and even with my wife sometimes. So anyway, and, and you heard that. I want to be honest. You heard that. Uh, guys, I think... You probably don't realize that, but when they have their mind made up, it's, it's all over. Like she said, she made up her mind second date that I didn't know that, that I was the guy who she was going to marry. And, uh, a little slow on it. A little slow on it, yeah. We catch on after a while. Um, I probably did the worst thing that a uh, soloist can do. <clears throat> I came in at the last moment from Connecticut and asked the organist if she would play. For me, accompaniment. That's not fair. But she said she would. In the song, I would like to sing it as well with my soul. Horatio Spafford wrote this after he had lost a son. What's that? Well, he lost three daughters in the sea, but he lost his son four years old before that. Lost property in the Chicago fire. He was a prominent lawyer. He was quite a uh, involvement in the Lord's work. And then when his wife arrived, she arrived in England, uh, and uh, she wired back, saved, saved alone, what do I do? And he wrote this, and he wrote the first verse as well. With, I'm going to sing that in a minute. <clears throat> but one verse that he wrote, you, you never see in the hymn book. It's never seen, but it's a very appropriate, and I'm going to say it. No pang shall be mine, for in death as in life thou will whisper thy peace to my soul. But Lord, tis for thee, for thy coming we wait. The sky, not the grave, is our goal. O trump of the angel, O voice of the Lord, blessed hope, blessed rest of my soul. We have that hope. I'm going to try to sing that. <coughs> When peace like a river attendeth my way, 
When sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. My sin, all oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Even so, praise the Lord, O oh, my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. Were you going to play an interlude just for the last verse? Yeah. And you can join in with me on the last refrain if you would like. And Lord, haste the day when the face shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trumpet shall resound and the Lord shall descend. Even so it is well with my soul it is well with my soul it is well it is well with my soul Thank you, Stan. It's my joy and honor, and I will tell you that it would be Nanny's joy to have her grand, great-grandson give the message of hope today. So Jonathan Deming. They say, live your life in such a way that the pastor doesn't have to lie about you at your funeral. I'm not a pastor, but I'm not going to lie to you either about Della, or has been shared, as we used to call her, Nan, or Nanny. <clears throat> I'll be honest, my memories of Nan, um, I'm 26, so I remember the last 15 to 20 years of the time that I shared with her, and for that reason, I sort of feel like the last person that probably ought to be up here. But I'm very happy that um, you got to get a sense of her life and who she was through the sharing that has been done already. For a good chunk of the time that I can rem remember, Nan had a, a hard road, uh, even as Grandpa shared earlier. It started off rough, ended rough. Spent nearly 50 years, a widow, takes a certain kind of perseverance, a, a God-given 
persistence to endure that. From the late mid to late 2000s until her passing this year, some seasons were better than others, uh, health-wise for her. But generally, after all, she was 90-plus years old, her health was in decline. Especially these last two years or so, um, a long life lived took its toll on Nan. And seeing her sporadically, as, as I did, uh, these last two years, it was, it was painful at times to, to see the, the strength leaving her body. But over the course of these 20 years or so that I remember, I, I largely saw Nan's, albeit limited, public life. I saw her at church, I saw her at family functions, a few occasions at her home with Rich and Florence, or even before that, Scotty. And I, I, I only caught little glimpses of Nan's inner life, her personal and private life. One thing I do know for sure, and that has been shared already, is that she, she loved dearly her family. As her grandchildren and great-grandchildren would often uh, taking their turns saying hello at family functions, it was always um, a joy to see her face light up like a child being tossed in the air saying, again, again, she would light up when, when we would come and say hello. And in contrast, as we would say goodbye, there'd be a, a faint shadow of, of sadness that would cast over her face, kind of like a young boy leaving a toy store, wondering, when am I going to get to go back? Especially in more recent years, Nan would always inquire, when will I see you again? This last, just a little bit over a year, I've been living and working in New Hampshire, and so uh, she very often, whenever I saw her, would, would ask, when are you coming home next? But from what those who knew her best tell me, and as has been shared this morning, she also loved her, her Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. She lived a, a life devoted to his word and his way, and as I, as I said, spending nearly half of her life as a widow that was by no means an, an easy thing to do. In her later years, she devoted herself to caring for others in whatever way she was able, be that writing cards of condolence, be sewing, as she was so good at. I have probably several pairs of pants that she worked on, or just being with people, spending time talking with the used to ladies and otherwise. What Nan knew was that there's two bas basically two ways to live your life. Either follow God or follow self. Either surrender to the majesty, holiness, and kindness of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or spend your life searching, seeking, bent in on yourself, trying to scratch every itch and satisfy every craving with whatever is most immediately available. These are the two options proposed by the Bible. The perspective of the Bible is this, that God made the world good. He made it whole and fruitful, and he created mankind as the crown of his creation. He gave man responsibilities chiefly to, to reign over the created world as God's representatives. But, as we read in the book of Genesis, mankind rebelled. The Bible says that we all, like sheep, have gone astray. In an act of cosmic treason, we have all turned our backs on God, done what is right in our own eyes instead of what is right in God's eyes. And the consequences for this rebellion is, frankly, death. Death was introduced into the world only after man turned away from God, having exalted himself, or ourselves, our own self-worth and sense of what is right and wrong above what God had set forth. But God was not done with mankind. God picked one man, one nation, through whom he promised to bless the whole world, Abraham and his children after him, the nation of Israel. And to these people, God made many promises. We read of them in the Old Testament. And throughout history, God has been faithful to keep each and every one and in what the Bible calls the, the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, 
Jesus Christ, the son of the carpenter, that kid from Nazareth, which is to say something like the kid from the backside of Nowheresville. Kind of like Nan, perhaps. And in Jesus Christ, God brought all the promises to completion. He fulfilled every last one. The Bible tells us that in Jesus Christ, all of God's promises are yes. And here's the beautiful and terrible irony of how Jesus accomplished this. He died. Jesus endured the very consequence of our rebellion against God. Having no fault of his own, no rebellion of his own to die for, he died on behalf of rebels like you and like me and, and like men. But the glorious truth is that he didn't stay dead. Having been buried on the third day, he walks out of the tomb, triumphing over death and making a way back to God for those who had alive. He now lives and reigns, seated at the right hand of God the Father, interceding on behalf of those who choose to follow him. And this is what Nan believed. She believed that anyone who repents of their rebellion and places their trust in Jesus, that turns away from their rebellion and towards Christ in faith, that one will receive pardon from God. That one will receive forgiveness for their transgressions and life eternal with God forever. Like I said, you really only have two options, two paths that you can choose. Follow God. Receive the transforming gift of eternal life through Christ or follow self. Remain the center of your own universe with all things bent in like gravity into you. It's kind of an ugly prospect when you think about it. There is no third option. There's no option for indifference, ambivalence, or mere tolerance. And so I encourage all of you, as my dad, Todd, said earlier, to consider the claims of Christ. Consider the claims of the Bible and see. See if it doesn't, with a foreign yet familiar sound, ring true. But you see, because Nan and myself shared this belief, I know the answer to the question that she would ask me so often. When will I see you again? I guess I should say I don't have the foggiest idea of when exactly I'm going to see her again, but what I do know is that I will. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. She has beheld the beauty of her maker and her savior. She has entered into the joy of her master, been embraced by her king, and heard him say, well done, good and faithful servant. And in that far country across the crystal sea called heaven, I will see her again someday. Many of you sitting here will see her again someday. And as such, though we grieve, we do so with hope. And hope does not put us to shame. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for the life of Della Deming, Nan. We thank you for her faithfulness to you, how you cared for her and showed your love to her, and how she, in turn, channeled that love onto the rest of us. Father, we thank you for the hope that we have and the experience that she is now having, the experience that you promised to us as well, if we should but repent of our sins and trust in you. We, ask that we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would join us in singing hymn number 463, Precious Lord, Take My Hand, Ruth will lead us in that next.
brief closing comments before our benediction. In the days leading up to Nanny's death, I can't say that I heard anything profound from the Lord as I sat there with her. But what I did experience was her profound love, as we've already said, for her family and friends. Also asking, so very often, if not all the time, about you. And after you talk to her for a few minutes about her, she'd say, okay, enough about me. Nothing changing here. How are you? She so much loved keeping up with all of us and what we were doing in our lives, and I believe truly prayed for us, probably on a daily basis. She was also immensely thankful, grateful for her family, her church here at Lafayette Federated Church, and her long life. I believe in particular, she would want you all to know how grateful beyond words she was for the love and care that my mom and dad, Richard and Florence, gave her over the years. Mostly the last 12 or so years as she lived with them. Mom and dad, you have done well. You displayed a command in scripture specifically pointed out in 1 Timothy to care for her loved ones, most importantly a widow, as we've said, who had lost her husband notably uh, in 1971. You've shown so well that even when it came at great sacrifice to your own health and well-being, it was vitally important to care for Nanny. I am confident and want you to know that she was, and we are, extremely grateful for your devotion and your care for Nanny. But possibly even more important, I am mostly eternally grateful for the devotion and obedience that you have shown to the Word of God. Did not come without trial and error, even tears, frustration at times, but Jesus was faithful. You endured, you have done well, immensely well. Nanny thanks you, I thank you, your family is grateful, and on behalf of this church, we thank you for the witness and tangible example of how to follow Jesus in this way. Thank you. After the benediction, the family has invited you downstairs to our gym for a repass, see them a bit, ask that you allow the family to get down there before, uh, before you all leave. At this time, for our benediction, it's a problem when you put too many papers up here. That's what Pastor told me. Don't do that. Okay. So, um, family friend, retired pastor, Pastor Don Barnhart, if he'd come up and give us our benediction. I've known Della and Demings for about 20 years. They were good years. I was thinking this morning, Dick said to me, uh, remember when we went over to see where I grew up uh, in Landaff and Lisbon? I lived in Lisbon with my family uh, in the middle 70s for a few years, and I don't think I mentioned one of the things I did. I had a little garbage route that I did, and I picked up the trash at the one-room schoolhouse in Landaff. Probably her mom attended there 40 years before then. You too. It's joyous to know Christian people, to fellowship with them. And it's been good to be a part of this celebration this morning. We've celebrated Della's life, and in another sense, we've celebrated 
God's faithfulness to Della. Let's now close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are thankful that you so worked in the life of Della Deming that we have hope in our hearts today that although this is a time of grief, yet it's a time of great joy because death will not have the victory because Jesus has. We pray that you would cause us in a similar manner to reflect on our own lives, our own relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we know in our hearts that we are not right with God, cause us to come to you and seek your mercy. As we go now to a time of refreshment and fellowship, we pray and thank you for the food that has been prepared and the hands that have prepared it. We pray that you would cause the fellowship to bring joy to our hearts as we think about all the things that you've done. Now to him who is able to keep us from stumbling, to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with great joy, God, our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen.